encouraging us. Sorry, I forgot to record. <laughs> Sorry, it's too busy. Now it's recording, yeah. Um, um, so yeah, our bright future um, enables us to kind of think differently and think in new ways about how we kind of um, involved young people in our projects. We're, we were at that stage just focusing on young people um, who were struggling with poor well-being. Um, since then, the, my place has kind of um, involves adults and people of all ages. But at the time, it was mainly focused on young people um, struggling with poor mental health. Um, so um, one of the things they also encouraged us to do was take some young people down to a mass lobby in London um, for the time is now. I don't know if any of you, probably lots of you were there, but it was an um, interesting um, mass lobby encouraging um, MPs to um, take action around the environment and around um, nature. Um, and, and there were so many great things that came out of that and the young people were so um, stoked up by it, the event, and so empowered by it. It was really amazing and they got filmed by loads of people and they were on telly and it was just an amazing event. Um, and then one of the other things I went off and did was I chatted to the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust. They were another um, Our Bright Future project and they had a program called Tomorrow's Natural Leaders um, and I got loads of help and advice from a guy there called Joe Wyatt. Um, who just said basically just set up your youth council it will work just do it and learn as you went along and it was just a really key bit of advice he gave me um hugely helpful um next slide please um so we launched our youth council in in january 2019 um and um, we did it by we kind of created a, a spec or a role for the, the council members um with age range and structure. Um, we put down on paper our, our expectations of them as council members and what they could expect from the role. Um, we then created a structure for the quarterly council meetings. Um, so it kind of um, shadowed the full board trustee meetings um, at the same time of year, um, usually about a week before. So the two kind of started to link. Um, we tried to remove all the barriers so that young people could attend. Um, so we set meetings that worked for them so tended to be at weekends or early evenings um, if they had travel costs we'd help meet those we tried to make it fun and interactive and provided food um, and then we yeah started to look at what the young people were wanting to get from that experience too um, next slide please Helena uh, yes going back to how we linked with our core aims as an organization so we linked the youth council meetings to the trustee meetings um, like the trustees meetings, we had an agenda and we had um, minutes from our meetings that we then shared with the board of trustees. We started to get our youth council to work on our campaign. So they're very involved in our peat free campaign. And they started to visit reserves and learn about um, some of the issues that um, the environment was facing and how they might get involved in that. Um, and then we also um, found champions and supporters within our organization. So. Um, Steve Garland was an early supporter, which made a huge difference um, and was quite instrumental in it kind of blossoming. Next slide, please. And um, I just sort of touched on the nuts and bolts. Of some of the things I did early on was that um, I wrote down the aims and the objectives of the Youth Council. Um, as I mentioned before, I talked about, um, I created a role description, so it was really clear, clear to the young people who were interested what was expected of them. Um, I had to make sure that we were covered in terms of safeguarding, safeguarding policy and our training, and um, we always have two members of staff um, and, and kind of key aspects. Um, we had to make sure we had parental and quality consent, so we created registration forms. Um, a, key, a key ally was um, Ellie in the um, communications team, and she came to um, most of the early meetings um, and that helped us link with our comms team which was really again really important. We also involved our, our trainees as well because um, at this time we didn't really have much resource in terms of staff it was mainly just me trying to fit it around my daytime job so using the trainees was a really good way of um, giving them a new experience and also getting seconders so in terms of safeguarding. We created a page on our website and then we also we created um, a new um, youth council recruitment process. In the early days, we were recruiting mainly from the young people we were already working with in our Wider Than My Place project. But um, last year, we 
put um, a call out across all our social media comms channels. Um, so any young person could apply. Um, and then we've created a sort of tenure, so they stay on for a year and then they have to reapply if they want to stay a second year. So their, their tenure is a maximum of two years. Um, so again, kind of trying to make it reflect or at least um, resemble in some ways um, what, what our trustees um, are expected to do as well. Uh, next slide, please. And um, and then in um, April of this year, oh, just to say, yeah, when COVID hit, of course, um, we moved everything online and we suddenly realised that actually that was quite um, freeing in some ways because Lancashire, Manchester, um, North Merseyside were a huge area and travel was a bit of a barrier for some of the young people. So suddenly we could host these meetings online and in some ways it was more accessible and it allowed us to do things we couldn't do before. So we had um, the chance to meet our MP, Kat Smith. Um, and yeah, it, it was just offered new opportunities that we started to use. And then in April 2021, we appointed our Youth Advocacy Officer, Eleanor, and that's just made everything um, blossom and grow in new exciting directions. So I'm gonna hand over to Eleanor now. Yes, thanks Emma. Um, yeah, there's, there's quite a lot to talk about, but I think the most important thing about the Youth Council is having, it's been that progression of, of who you recruit for the Youth Council. So this year we have a really, really um, great group of, of 12 um, Youth Council members. This has gone up and down. So we had 11, then we had 14, and then we had 12. So I think the key thing would be to not, um, not get upset or not worry if you do lose a couple of members because um, young people's lives change quite a bit. They might get a job or they might um, have a change in circumstances in their personal life. So just to be quite flexible with, with how you recruit and who you're recruiting and to recognize that not every member on the youth council is going to bring the same skills and the same um, time commitment and the same sort of energy um, as others and to, I think a learning curve for me is to recognize each individual youth council members um, kind of important um, traits and, and how they work and fit in with the youth council, which actually can be a lot of work. I'm not going to lie. Like it can be quite difficult sometimes to manage 12 different peoples differently. But um, after a few in-person events, I say are really important. They start to work together as a collective, which has been really nice to see over the past month. And um, yeah, I think flexibility is sometimes the key um, that I found and something that I've had to learn as well on the job. Um, yeah, and they, they're just great. I think they're just a really great group of people who want to make a difference and they're passionate to make a difference. And like Emma said, having the paying for their travel costs to places is really important because it's not a big cost for the trust, but it is a big cost for, for them. So just having that support for them um, is really important. And yeah, I think this is just, because they're such a great group of people, it's really led on to, to Tom wanting to work more with them, with other members of our trust, recognizing their kind of abilities and also them bringing something new to the table, which is always kind of fascinating, fascinating to watch it kind of grow. Um, yeah. Is, is there anything else you think I should touch upon, Emma? I was just going to say, do you want to just kind of briefly mention the kind of things that they've been involved in recently, the kind of things they get up to for us? Yeah, so also, so, so governance side, they've been attending trustee board meetings, um, conservation committee meetings, hopefully in the future they'll attend marketing meetings and policy and advocacy ones, and um, our trust is quite good we don't want to just be a spectator like they are they, we want them to ask questions and to be involved in the meeting um so that's one aspect they've been involved in um focus groups so ones for our bright future um for the marketing team to try and get younger people involved um they've also been involved in content creation so we're currently working on the peak free um campaign but we're trying to take a slightly different angle about like why should people care about Pete and why should young people care about Pete who have no connection to it at all so we're putting a little bit of a spin on some traditional campaigns that we've had and hopefully um you know towards the end of the year and beginning of next year they'll, they'll run their own sort of campaign but based off LWTs and the wildlife trust values and um it's kind of a give and take relationship so 
I have also organized practical conservation um, AQAs for them. So they're working through that now, as well as the John Muir Award. So they'll attend, um, they've done peatland restoration and they'll be helping with the sand dunes project as well. So um, they're getting these practical conservation experience, but also while they're there, they're helping create content and engaging other young people in the work that we're doing. So it's a two-way street, but um, they're great to work with. And I think they love working with us and. Um, we've had such great feedback about um, confidence building. Um, I think one 13 year old we have on the council who's really, really clever and just really engaged said that they never knew you could have different jobs in conservation. They always thought it was like you're out there digging holes where actually you can be community engagement or you can be in marketing or you can be in you know, advocacy. And I think that's what we're opening the door to is just um, letting young people see that there's, there's a whole world of jobs that we want them to be involved in um, and they just didn't know about it from school. Thanks, Anna. I think, have we just got one more slide, I think? I got one more slide. Oh yeah, well, yeah, so we have, um, leading on from this, and this has been kind of um, having Tom and Steve on board and the marketing team and the comms team on board has been really instrumental in creating this new group. So it's a youth campaigning group. It's called Wilder Youth. Um, and it focuses on um, calling all 11 to 24 year olds. And we're focusing on the 30 by 30 campaign. So we're trying to engage more young people within their local area to engage with these 30 by 30 campaign and also to kind of have a bigger impact. So um, kind of joining the Wildlife Trust as a whole in, in kind of advocating for this at the policy level as well. Um, and yeah, this wouldn't have been possible without, I think the Youth Council being so kind of um, influential and, and inspiring, I think is the word as well. So from, from the Youth Council at three years ago to this, like this is essentially, I, I'd say part of their kind of legacy, they've kind of paved the way for this group to come through. And yeah, so that's exciting. I'll let you know how that goes because it's still a work in progress. <laughs> Pass them to you, Emma. Thanks. Yeah, um, it's made a huge difference having Eleanor on our team and um, having that dedicated resource and someone so enthusiastic and um, embracing of youth voice has just meant all of the early work has been utterly amplified. Um, so these are just some quick top tips about setting up your own youth council learn from others, we did and we still are, <laughs> and we're still trying to figure things out as we're going along. Um, push on open doors in your organization and find allies. Um, you know, it's fair to say not, not everybody in the early days within our organization perhaps kind of got it or, or, or thought we should be even kind of spending time trying to work out what young people think about things. So, but a lot of people did. So you, you work with the people who, who kind of get it. Don't wait until you know everything. <laughs> As me and Eleanor are kind of saying, we're, we're still learning and figuring things out. And um, it's been it's been great having our bright future actually to to have um, that mechanism to learn from other projects. And um, that's been kind of really instrumental for us. So yeah, a, a big thanks to our bright future. Um, build opportunities for young people in everything you do. And yeah, just just do it because there's such it's been such an amazing journey for us. And why wouldn't you? I think that's what I'd say. At a time we need young voices in everything that we do. Um, yeah. And I think that's enough for me and Ella. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm Tom. I'm the CEO at Lancashire Wildlife Trust. I've been here since December. Um, and I was just asked to say a little bit um, with a kind of chief executive perspective, really, about what I think the organisation gets out of the Youth Council and actually kind of trying to make this kind of youth voice a little bit more central to everything we do and why I think it's a really good idea and hopefully to inspire some of you to do the same. Um, I think the really obvious point to make is that I've never worked at Lancashire Wildlife Trust without one. So um, for, it's just sort of totally normal, I guess, that, that they're there. And uh, some of you will have seen um, and heard about the concept of radical hospitality. So uh, Professor Hari Han, um, who is an academic in, uh, in the United States, I know it'd be very inspiring for Craig Bennett and uh, as our uh, national CEO. And this, this approach of uh, trying to engage one in four people in taking action for nature and climate, and that that's when you get real social change. And she's got this idea of radical hospitality, which is that most people don't start with the cause. Most people associate with other people that they like and get on with and who are friendly and welcoming. 
and then having spent time with them then slowly the support for the cause grows and i think for me that is really at the heart of what the youth council is about and the youth council as um as emma described you know did grow out of the the um you know my place and a lot of the initial members have come through the the my place program and the one of the huge successes of my my place with the ecotherapy and the um green social prescribing is that actually people started getting involved with the trust um to to be better you know to become healthier and, and and better people who are really struggling and then actually really wanted to stay on and get involved with with environmental issues you know past their their involvement with that project and that kind of is a it is a bit of an example of radical hospitality because once you spend time with sort of inspired and inspiring and motivated people who love the environment that passion just becomes really infectious and that's definitely something that i think has been generated through the youth council um, but I actually met the youth council before it officially started. So they were radically hospitable with me and they invited me to one of their meetings, which was, I think it was like, it was the Saturday before I started on the Monday, I think from memory, and basically invited me and it was on Zoom. It was really easy. I was making bread in the background while, while I was joining their meeting. And it was just absolutely brilliant as a new member of staff to have my first proper welcome to the trust to be from the youth council. And that made an absolutely sort of massive impression on me. And I think when you spend any time with them, um, like we did in the, uh, the woods um, just sort of a couple of weeks ago, um, it's just their, their love of each other, I think, and the, the, just how open and inclusive they are as a group. Um, that really does rub off, I think, on anyone who spends any time with them. And it's absolutely brilliant. And it just makes you want to do that with other people as well. And it just sort of becomes this wonderful sort of pos positive, um, ever-increasing spiral. Um, and I think that is different from how often sort of professional conservationists think where we start with the cause and then we try and, and get people involved. And it can make us a little bit stuffy and a little bit exclusive and a little bit off-putting, actually, if we're trying to reach out to new people. So that's kind of my starting point, I think, kind of in a nutshell for why I think the Youth Council is so great. Um, but actually having this youth, youth voice um, and really sort of trying to make it not a kind of tokenistic sort of sideshow but central to so much of what we do it opens doors i think that we wouldn't necessarily all, all always be able to do particularly in the outside world so um eleanor and emma have both mentioned already um the example with uh, with cat smith mp we do have a lot of mps i have to say in lancashire and manchester and merseyside but she she is one of our um our really key ones and actually, one of the things that I think the Youth Council um, have, have cottoned on to is that if they invite an MP, uh, and hopefully now we're going to be expanding this to councillors, if they invite an MP, the MP is often a lot more likely to join to have a discussion about a topic than if we invite them as a professional staff. Because for them, it's also an opportunity to engage with a core part of their, their electorate or their future electorate, you know, that they wouldn't normally have an opportunity to because so many of their meetings are invited by men and women in suits. So I think that that opening of doors is really, really powerful and seems to be working. And with the youth campaigning group, something that we're going to make a lot more of, particularly because, of course, the youth council come from all over. They come from central Lancashire, south Lancashire, Merseyside, Manchester, Bolton, uh, Bury, uh, Wigan. And actually, when each of those have got their own MPs, you only need one of the youth council to live in that area and they can invite the MP as their local MP. And suddenly they get everybody. And, and, and it's, it's really powerful that. Um, the other example that, uh, from my time that I feel has made a massive difference is the conversation about uh, Wigan Flashes National Nature Reserve. So you'll all be aware that to, 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 to get an NNR, um, you, have to have, you have to meet these very kind of scientific criteria, such as 10% of the national population of key target species. Um, and no matter how you cut it, and we've tried with different boundaries uh, with, with Wigan Flashes, we can only get to 2.5% of, of the, the national population of willow tits. It's not quite enough. But Natural England do really want us to become an NNR um, because they, they need more sort of urban sites as part of their, the suite. And the work in Wigan is fantastic. That's kind of a topic for another time. But actually, one of the things we did in Wigan uh, was to in, engage the, the youth audience. And there's this wonderful film called New Voices in, uh, in Nature Recovery, which I think we have shared around. I certainly shared it with Craig uh, before and, and RSWT. We can sort of share it with you. And there's also lots of these kind of bite-sized little pieces, which are talking heads with, with members of the Youth Council, which went onto social media. And just really 
just explaining why for them uh, Wigan flashes is important and why why you know we need to be more sort of uh, creative when we're when we're sort of coming up with uh, protected designation. And I think to have the power of those voices who've been out there getting involved in practical work, campaigning locally, speaking up for this landscape and, you know, sharing it on social media, making films, speaking to MPs, you know, and, and speaking in really importantly with the policymakers, the decision makers in natural England is just so powerful on top of obviously all the other work that we're doing. Um, I think it's really important not to overlook how well networked a lot of our young people are. Um, and I think there's perhaps be a little bit sort of um, patronizing maybe and you think that you know without us you know they don't kind of have an outlet and like it's just incredible like so we have members of our, our youth council a couple of them are youth mps so they've, they're much more politically connected than i am um and and that again you know they can actually be introducing us to their networks um and as i say a lot of it is really kind of high level or they can introduce us to other councils and other gatherings of young people that they're all, all already involved in and I think that is really powerful. Um, I think the kind of the vibrancy and the liveliness is really important. So um, again, you know, Eleanor and Emma have mentioned this already, but a lot of our campaigns, the youth council are making short films, getting them on social media, sharing them around all their followers and networks and hearing again, you know, in their voice is brilliant. Um, I was shared one by, uh, by Mohammed, who um, I think is probably the very intelligent 13 year old that Eleanor referred to, and he is just incredible. Um, he's been homeschooled, so he's got quite a kind of really unique perspective on the world. And his 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 thirty by thirty little short film he did, um, which was uh, sorry, it wasn't thirty by thirty. Sorry, thirty days wild. I mean, his thirty days wild film, which was explaining what he was going to be doing during the month of June, was absolutely beautiful. He'd done these little kind of nature films, and um, he's a sort of nature writer and poet in his spare time, and he's. He, he won some kind of youth poetry award and he kind of that that really lyrical language came through and anyway on the back of that i'd been invited to speak at a youth sort of summit basically in lancashire it was a common purpose gathering and it was uh, creating a cleaner greener lancashire by 2045 and i thought actually if we're speaking to, to that audience i want mohammed there i want to invite him and, and we did we kind of worked on our presentation together and I got okay feedback and he just absolutely just wiped the floor with me. And he got such brilliant feedback from everybody and just the comments that were pouring in because he, you know, the, the kind of the slightly older young people, the kind of 18 to 21 year olds, the kind of students and people who are just getting jobs, it, you know, a variety of sectors around Lancashire for them to hear from Mohammed was just incredible. Um, so, yeah, I think that that liveliness of the social media can sort of take you places that you wouldn't necessarily get to. Um, Otherwise, and I can't deny, you know, it improves our credibility and our reputation locally as Lancashire Wildlife Trust. It definitely makes us feel more relevant, more engaged, uh, gets us to different audiences uh, and even different forums, I think, than we would without, without the Youth Council. Um, there are some practical benefits as well, just sort of, you know, bottom line kind of things. So um, I think for us to have help with particularly campaigns, is really great because we've I've got one part time um, senior conservation officer for policy and advocacy. He's also got to deal with all our planning applications and you know links in with RSWT. Some of some of you will know Dave Dunlop, and so suddenly he's got like an army of people who can write letters and make links with councillors and you know um, you know actually do research for them as well. You know find out information. Um, Peat Free campaign is a really good example. Uh, where they're not just sort of doing what we tell them to do. Youth Council, they've got their own ideas and, and you know, their own places they think we should get to. So having that kind of army, um, it's probably not a very um, good analogy, but you know what I mean? It's sort of, uh, it's great just having more people involved and, and, and really, um, really well motivated. Um, I think business planning is another area. So we, we have already spoken with the Youth Council about our new business plan that we're producing. So following on from the um, 2030 strategy, uh, from the from the wildlife trusts and actually what's great when you ask the youth council about what they feel should be the focus of our business planning is it does give you a slightly different take because it's slightly less traditional it's less around you know sort of nature reserves and species recording and and actually it's kind of less commercial as well in a lot of ways and they're, they're the ones who actually they want to get involved in marine work and marine campaigns which we don't do enough in Lancashire um, for such a sort of uh, proud uh, maritime county um, I've mentioned the campaigns, but it's also this really strong voice, I think, for nature wherever you live, rather than just the sort of 
um, sort of ecologically rich places in sort of more traditional rural areas. So I think that voice to sort of urban conservation, green space as well, rather than just nature reserves. You know, uh, some of their comments around training and development and the, the importance of actually us as an employer. I think we overlook that and the young people remind us of that. And another one that was really powerful for me that I remember from um, from the Wigan film was actually the importance of accessibility. So uh, one of our um, sort of wider members of the youth council, a guy called James, is in a motorized wheelchair. And he did this incredible film saying, unless, unless that reserve is accessible, I can't actually go and engage with nature on any level. And some of our trustees at the time, one in particular, was being really snooty about why we were investing in accessible paths in Wigan. And actually, you just show show him the 60, 60 second film that James made, and it's like point point done. There's no question we should be doing that. So I think that that you know that focus on slightly different things is important. Um, I think just sort of kind of finishing off. I think the other area um, is we've obviously, uh, along with all trusts I know, are trying to focus more on the um, equality, diversity, and inclusion. And it, it can, even, even for those of us who really care about it, it can sometimes feel like a little bit of something that you're having to kind of, I don't know, retrofit to your organisation. And, and I think what's brilliant about the Youth Council is it just normalises conversations, which can sometimes be a bit tricky uh, in, a, in a big organisation with 150 members of staff. And I think what's lovely about spending time with the Youth Council is that questions, I mean, for me, actually, particularly around sexuality and around gender identification, it's really, really normal. It's very out in the open. Everyone's talking about it. Just things like the sharing of the personal pronouns, which we don't have a culture of at all at Lancashire Wildlife Trust. The Youth Council started doing it, and then actually other people start doing it. And actually, this sort of understanding that not everybody who works for our organisation you know, might, might identify either as male or female, but there, there is kind of more of a spectrum. That is not a conversation that we'd ever had at the Lancashire Wildlife Trust, but it comes because it comes through the Youth Council and then suddenly it normalises it. And that for me, I think is probably, um, in, terms of, in terms of Lancashire Wildlife Trust, the Youth Council and some of the wider culture of the My Place project as well, it has transformed us in a way that I think we would be really struggling in the modern world without it, if I'm honest. It sort of dragged us kicking and screaming. Um, and that is powerful. That's so much more powerful than, um, you know, the trustees deciding to do a sort of EDI drive or something like that. So I think that is an important point I don't want to overlook. And then just to finish off um, with a couple of sort of, I don't know, practical things, I suppose. One of them, um, which I am a big believer on, is um, shadowing. So workplace shadowing and i have invited uh, and had some brilliant experiences with a couple of the, the youth council who have spent time shadowing me personally uh, and we've made sure that that's over about a week um, and that there's been an opportunity for a site visit uh, but also to attend if i'm at a meeting other than a sort of confidential one-to-one -one, that the youth councillor comes along with me so we've had business planning meetings uh, senior management team uh, external meetings with partners um, we had a really good training session, which was um, around kind of campaigning and uh, policy. Um, and basically, if I attend it, then the, the youth councillor can attend as well. And I have had some really good feedback about that. And that's definitely a scheme that we're going to be carrying on. Um, Eleanor mentioned Zoom. And actually, doing that by Zoom is the easiest thing in the world because you just send them an invite and they join and ask them questions and listen in. And then, you know, having a debrief afterwards and a bit of a prelim beforehand. Um, I think it, you know, it's been a great experience, I think, for me and, and for them. Um, and then one thing which we haven't sorted yet, but I'm, I sort of I really want to try and crack, is at the moment our, our youth work, and particularly um, having a youth advocacy officer, does feel a little bit dependent on funding, external funding. And we've got to build this into the core work that we do so that this becomes part of everything that we do every year. And it's just a given, it's a core function of, of, of Lancashire Wildlife Trust. And one of the things I'm keen to look at is basically whether we can underwrite the, um, the salary of the youth advocacy officer. And you do need somebody, you know, I think you do need somebody to lead and be that link in to the youth council. So if we can underwrite the salary, what we can maybe look at then is that every project and, you know, every aspect of core, uh, our core delivery, our, our core strategy, if, you know, them then kind of doing kind of small recharges to buy parts of the officer time um, is a really great way to make sure that we get our youth work embedded in every project without having to necessarily kind of endlessly 
um, and quite riskily try and uh, do funding applications to do our youth work. So that is something that we're looking at at the moment, and um, and uh, I really, really hope we can we can build into our new business plan because um, I think that will have a long uh, a lot of power, and it then makes it probably here to stay. Um, and mentioned them quite a few times, but you can't do this sort of stuff without amazing people like Emma and Eleanor. Um, and I think they are absolutely brilliant. They are so motivated, so in, so inspiring, so passionate about youth work, and uh, the way that they. Um, just work with the youth council and and also just are sort of endlessly pestering of other members of staff but in a really nice way is brilliant so you know they're they're really good at keeping everybody informed about about what the youth council are doing setting up meetings actively inviting us rather than leaving it to chance saying actually how about this and do you think this is a good idea and why don't you do that but doing it in such a great way um so i think that they are both a kind of just a really good template, I think. If you if we could clone Emma and Eleanor, um, I mean, just generally, not necessarily just for the Wildlife Trust movement, but um, I think it would be fantastic. So that, anyway, that's my final thought. Uh, and over to Steve, who's our chair. Okay, thanks, Tom. Lots of lots of really good stuff there that I agree wholeheartedly with as well. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit from the sort of trustee point of view of all this as well. Uh, when I took over as chair, which is more than six years ago, I, I had a board um, that was definitely not diverse, um, mostly men, all white, mostly old, no terms of office, dead man's shoes for a seat on the board. It was really never going to go anywhere. So one of my main objectives immediately was to start putting things in place to address that. And we, we, we changed the way we recruited trustees. We put terms of office in, so people, people left. And um, amazingly, the, the stuff we did resulted very fast in, in a phenomenal change in the sort of applications we were getting for trustees. So in terms of ethnicity and gender particularly, we were really successful straight away, but we weren't successful in terms of age. We didn't get many younger applicants. And that was disappointing for me, but at least the other things were a, a, a huge leap forward. So I was quite pleased with the overall outcome, really. But at the same time, I, I knew that I saw the youth forum coming along and this group of young people. So I, um, I've always had quite an affinity with what young people are doing. I find that through my whole working career, very inspiring. So I quickly got involved with this and spent a lot of time going to the meetings and really listening and watching. And um, I realized that this was possibly the way we, in some way, was going to in influence and diversify our uh, governance in terms of age issues. And so um, I quickly saw how dynamic the group is. Tom's already said that. And um, I think the fact that I took a personal interest was quite important because um, some of the feedback I've had is that have, knowing that the board, the chair, therefore by implication trustees have this link and know what's going on and, how, and are positive and supportive about it, I think that is quite important. Um, very quickly, when we were discussing various issues, um, Tom and Emma have already outlined a lot of the sorts of things that were going on, all very exciting, all very relevant to the trust. But from my point of view as a chair, the $64,000 question was, how can we involve this group or people within this group in our governance? I, we've got a board of trustees, we've got lots of committees and everything. And so I quickly brought this sort of issue up with the group and we discussed it. And immediately there was great interest. At this stage, a number of people had done some of the work, you know, lobbying parliament and so on. So there were people present there who were not scared of, you know, formality and official meetings and that sort of thing. So they were really excited about this. So as a first stage, what we did do is um, effectively, it's rather like Tom's shadowing he's talked about. We invited, um, pairs of um, youth council members to come along 
to all the various meetings and that was um conservation committee meetings full board meetings executive meetings any meeting um unless there was again unless there was something of real personal issue there that they would step out for a few minutes but they they sat through all of the meetings and then i went along to meet to their meetings and asked for feedback and it was all really positive and to me it wasn't just the young people coming to see the meetings i was also interested in the trustees seeing the, and meeting the young people because i'm coming back to some of the issues at the end but one of the things that concerns me i worked in the museum sector and i did a lot there to engage younger people in the work that museums did when you've got groups of older people they can be quite patronizing to young people and i've come across this so many times they make the there are assumptions made that they're not really interested that they will get bored sitting in a formal meeting you know i'm sure some of the younger members of you have probably heard these things and it's not true you know if you're meeting if they get bored in the meeting it's probably probably most of my board members are bored as well because the meeting's boring it's nothing to do with age it's to do with how you run your meetings so anyway um it was interesting to see the reaction of other trustees. We had an opportunity for everybody to ask questions. And again, the young people that attended these meetings didn't have to be encouraged to ask questions. Um, I made it clear that they were part of the meeting and they should join in and they did and they asked questions. And I think that was a huge important thing in terms of the trustees meeting those people. And I think also the issue of two, two people coming along together, because that gives you an opportunity for them to discuss it afterwards, and it makes it easier for them to report back to the group. Um, it's not quite so frightening if you've got somebody you know well in a room full of strange people, albeit in recent years that's been on Zoom, but it was, it was in person for quite a number of them in the early days. This process, though, is not complete, because my real aim of this is to... Um, Diversify, diversify the governance, the board, more with young people present. And we've still got some issues to sort out here. I mean, do we, do we just encourage people to um, apply through the normal channels as trustees? Do we have some seats dedicated to youth council on the board? We haven't resolved those ones yet, but we will be discussing those with the board and with the young people. And at the moment, we're going through a major governance review and the young people are part of that. Tom's already mentioned the business planning and so on that we're discussing. Um, I went along and gave an update to Youth Council on the business planning process. And um, all I can say is the, the level of questioning at the end of it was I think slightly better and of a higher <laughs> quality than my own board. So uh, <laughs> certainly harder to answer, but they're, already fully engaged in that so we have a lot of work to do in working out the actual mechanics of this and how it will work but it is going to happen and the important thing is by having these attendance at meetings my trustees are now on board with all of this um i think some of them possibly still haven't completely got their heads around it but the vast majority have and it's made a real difference so just going through some of the issues to consider i mean one of the things that's been mentioned by emma already almost impassive really is is about meetings you can accessibility to meetings and accessibility to um the process of governance can be an issue what time do you meet people who haven't people who don't drive and haven't got a car you know most of the board members have a car uh, where do you meet how do you meet how do you communicate all of these things need thinking about i mean we need to think about them anyway because they apply to a lot the, a lot of other board members but they are quite key and you can find yourself excluding people without really realizing it and i think the other important thing is to talk and uh, i've been talking to the youth council and the most important thing is to listen to what they say when you ask them questions don't make assumptions because uh, otherwise you get something to difficulties so um As I say, we've got some challenges left to, to overcome. Um, I actually finished my stint as chair in about uh, a month's time. But I think the positive thing of all this is because I've got a lot of trustees who have kind of engaged this, um, I don't feel any 
worry at all about this process continuing when I've retired as chair. The only thing that is needed really is I think we do need some sort of champion, some sort of link with a trustee who is there to just keep this process going. I've been that link when I retire. That needs, that's the only bit that's missing at the moment, but I think it'll happen. So I think that probably summarises the special trustee chair element of this, I hope. And um, I think now I've obviously not been able to keep track of what's going on in terms of questions in the chat. But if you have some questions you want to put to any of us, please put them in the chat there. Uh, I'll ask Eleanor now to um, take over that element. And, yeah, um, yeah. Um, I was going to ask Steve, I'm, I'm probably mm. Tom as well. Um, if you're, I think I've been quite quite lucky, like I've, I've met both of you quite early on and Tom's probably sick of me now, sees me all the time. But um, how would you um, say to get that link if you're a project officer level how do you build that link with the trustee board or with the ceo if you don't have that what would be your advice to go through senior management to find a champion but not everybody has that direct link to trustee boards and ceos mm -hmm. and how to overcome yeah. that i think okay. i think it's only my experience i sort of mentioned it is i got invited really early on so for me, it was just as a new member of staff, it was just normal that there was a youth council and I would be invited to it. So I think it's very difficult. It, well, it's not very difficult, but it's harder to not go to something when you've been actively invited by someone who's being nice to you. I do think that's really, really important. I think the other thing for us, um, who is a sort of probably bit of a um, forgotten um, hero, would be Monica, I think. So um, Monica is our... Um, governance and policy officer um and she was at one point the sort of ceo assistant um but she's brilliant because she's sort of um been a link to the youth council she's a link to the board and the link to the chief executive so actually you know she was a was a good person so i think sometimes if you can engage every organization's got a gatekeeper hasn't it i think you know even small wildlife trusts there'll be um someone who kind of knows everyone and makes everything work on a day-to-day -day basis um, and I think if you can get to those sorts of people and then get them sending out the invites and hooking people in, I think that's really powerful. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing I would add to that as well from a trustee point of view is that I think you've obviously got a lot of people here from a lot of different trusts. And I know from my personal experience, trusts are very diverse and the boards are very diverse. Di I don't mean the boards are diverse, but there are boards vary a lot in their outlook. Let's put it that way. I mean, I personally would be very happy to talk, you know, if somebody wants me to go and infuse to their board or infuse to their chair about these issues, um, I'm very happy to do that because I do it all the time at uh, meetings where I meet other chairs anyway. So um, I do realise, you know, this wouldn't have happened before we started to change our board. It, it wouldn't have been seen as a serious proposition and it, it just it just wouldn't have happened so i can see how a board might block this not maybe intentionally so if i can help it you know if, if somebody would feel i could help in any way i think that would be good because i think you do need you know tom it, tom can be an advocate to other ceos i can be an advocate yeah. to other trustees and chairs and i think it may need that sometimes um yeah um there's a that's great thank you steve there's, um, there was a question from um, Becca about diversity um, and how do you ensure diversity on the board? Um, how do you ensure diversity or, or has that come with time? We have warm young people who are keen to be on the council but not necessarily from a variety of backgrounds. Um, I mean, I can start off on this one. I'd say don't, don't block people, don't not have a board because of that I mean you have to start somewhere and I think diversity does come over time and diversity doesn't come just in you know what color people's skin is it comes in people's background and lived experiences as well so although we have many people from university backgrounds um, one young woman you know moved around every year from a single mother background and had a very different experience to another man who was stable family, lived in one place in the country sort of background. So I would never say, you know, you don't really know people's full backgrounds until you until you work with them. So yeah, don't neglect the lived experience 
And then, I don't know, Emma, if you found have anything else, but maybe we have done some targeted recruitment. So working with like National Citizen Service and stuff, you can you can do that. So you are incorporating and you're trying to work with communities who maybe you don't have that connection to nature. So you can do both. It doesn't have to be one or the other, but definitely have some keen beans in there. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that um, when we put out the open call for new council members the end of last year, and we there were 12 positions at that point, and we had over 50 young people apply. So it allow, allowed us to, uh, to look at their skill set and their enthusiasm and chat to them about why they were interested. But it also meant we could choose geographically across the whole area that we you know, had a mix of young people from all parts of our geographical area. But also we could build in a diversity into that and that's what we did we actively did that and it allowed us to do it um so that that was a, just, was a to add opportunity. A, just to add a little angle from my experience of diversifying our trust board one of the issues is people people seeing what the board does i found out an issue really was that nobody really knew what a trustee was so the fact that i mean with with the youth council it's quite high profile it's it's present in a lot of our social media and you see it very high, very clearly. I think that's really important because people see people doing that and they think, oh, that, they're like me. I could do that too. That's interesting. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's got to be part of your kind of marketing and communication, which the Youth Council is, I think. It does it very well. We weren't as a board. I still think we need to improve a little bit. And the next question is from Ian. Um, from Warwickshire, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Hi, thanks. Yeah, I was gonna. I just wanted to ask this because it was a bit of an essay to write in the uh, in the box. But um, we, we've been working with young people and had a couple of young people projects in Warwickshire, and it's been really powerful. And the young people have been just <clears throat> um, really transformational in terms of how their um, passion has come across to the staff. One of the things we've struggled with is <clears throat> um, integrating them into genuinely making changes within the organization some of the examples you showcased with them going out on site and campaigning and going to the time is now launch and stuff like that we've done but that's felt like they're acting kind of on our behalf for supporting our cause rather than making a genuine change and i think one of the things i'm interested by by formally creating the council aspect is that ability to influence strategy and policy and both Tom and Steve touched on kind of that, but didn't really give any tangible examples of exactly how that's happened. So have you got any examples of where they've genuinely influenced you to do something different as a result of their opinion? Or, and kind of linked to that, how have you set the brief? Do you kind of, do you give them agenda items to discuss at the council meeting or do they come with you with things and say, we absolutely should be focusing on this? Or could you talk a bit more about how that works, please? Who wants to go first? Um, I think I think probably in terms of if I start with the say something like the business plan. So so you know what we don't have uh, a history of a Lancashire Wildlife Trust is is any kind of forward planning beyond the next financial year. So the whole get up has basically been a process of pulling together next year's budget. And that's pretty much the end of the future, the, the forward planning. So what we're doing at the moment is we're trying to focus on what the priorities are for the next, the next five years, okay? Uh, and potentially even further afield. So, you know, what, what are the things that we need to be doing to, to you know, to address um, the biggest problems we're facing in, uh, in, in Lancashire and, and Merseyside and Manchester? And, and obviously that, that's always going to end up sort of coalescing around um, 30 by 30 and one in four taking action for nature. Um, and I think straight away, one of the things that, that happens when you talk to the youth council is that, is that they're, they're already really, really engaged in what the future looks like and what it means for them. So the kind of tangible things, and it's not necessarily, none of this stuff I don't think is new things that we're not already thinking about. It's more that the emphasis we give things changes. So I think I did mention a couple of things. I mean, I mean the really, really obvious one is, is climate. So when you're thinking about, um, you know, Langshaw Wildlife Trust, you know, does come from quite a, 
it is quite a straight um you know nature conservation background like like we all are and yeah we, we do have a good history of urban um of urban nature conservation as well but for for the for the youth council there is no difference between climate action and nature action they're two sides of the same coin and and so so actually rather than seeing climate targets or energy reduction targets or sequestration targets are somehow slightly different they're just the same thing so you kind of you're embedding the idea of climate action sort of in in everything you do so that would be one area i mentioned marine as well so i think you know we um we do struggle a little bit we you know we we've got the northwest living seas officer but they're hosted by cumbria wildlife trust and actually um for the young people to go we want to get involved in marine campaigns and actually they're not saying we want to they're saying you're going to do some marine campaigns because we want to be part of it and if you don't we're going to do it anyway so i think that that would be that would be another example um i think uh some of the focuses on um so i, I mean this is another another kind of very tangible example would be we talk a lot don't we about about nature engagement and what it means to engage in the natural world and we obviously have 30 days wild and our a couple of members of our youth council ran a um basically a workshop at this common purpose uh, event i mentioned that i mentioned before which was lots of sort of young people from across the county uh, working in in every sort of sector that you could imagine and one of the things that came out of that was we were trying to talk about nature engagement and then because it was young people speaking to young people they went well we didn't really know what nature engagement is what, what's what's engaging with the natural world mean what on earth does that mean so it sort of changes your starting point so rather than thinking that you know you've got to get people to your nature reserve so they can come and you know experience the joy of bird song and dragonflies it sort of just takes you back a step so from a business plan you know we've got to think so much harder about about the young people who actually and not just young people but you know their their families the backgrounds they come from where you know they're i don't know they're living in blackpool they've never been to the seaside and they live in blackpool so i just think that kind of changing your perspective on just how disengaged from the natural world you know the people that they know know are and the backgrounds they come from that i think is really really powerful so as we go through talking about how to get one in four people taking action for nature it's like well You've, you've got to start at a really, really basic level, just sort of trying to get, forget about nature, like the outdoors. Let's get the outdoors part of people's lives, day, day, you know, daily lives. And I think that's the kind of thing that the Youth Council uh, have really helped with. And, and at the very beginning, I talked about the kind of the radical hospitality. And I think understanding that you don't start with the cause, that sometimes you start with the people and then the cause comes. I think it's that different perspective and that different way of working. So I think those are some of the really tangible things, but it's a combination of us inviting youth council to meetings where we're talking about the business plan and us going to the youth council and asking them what they think. And you don't talk, you don't say business plan, you talk about what should we be doing differently in the future. So you kind of just use a different language. Um, ironically, I think we're sometimes better at doing it with the youth council than we are with some of our, our staff and definitely with our volunteers. So we've got really important lessons which is almost the way we work with the youth council. That's the way we need to work better with all our supporters because we're not at the moment. I just want one other little specific thing. I think they've moved us forward in the way we campaign to this sort of activism type of thinking. Um, we had a spread in our magazine of a uh, number of the young people with their posters down in London during one of the uh, campaigns and visiting parliament. And while our trusts in the past have been accused of being a bit too much on the fence, and I think it's making, I, I can see it starting to change the way people think. Interestingly though, when that appeared in our magazine, we got a couple of emails from members complaining because they didn't feel comfortable with this because it's not what wildlife trusts do. Uh, well, it is what wildlife trusts do. Um, what, of course, we didn't see maybe was the hundreds of people who thought it was a great idea, maybe thousands of people. Uh, and we didn't see maybe the 200 members we got on the back of it as well. So, yeah, I think I think there are already changes happening there. It's given us the confidence to do that, which we didn't have before. 
I was just going to add that I think I think you're right, and I think it's about a, a shift of power. So I think youth engagement is sometimes seen as something that, that is done to young people. And I think youth advocacy is is about putting the power of the young people. And I think it's it's a process, and we want to start that process. I can think of a particular example where there was a discussion about with some of our comms team about TikTok, and so some of the youth council want to do TikTok films, and they met a bit of resistance from um parts of our comms team because there was a kind of worry about well how do we um populate that how do we put on keep putting resources on a tiktok account it was a fair you know a fair comment so we're experimenting now and we're handing over to the youth council and they're currently making us some tiktok films and we're going to see how it goes so that's just one example of a tangible change that they've made yeah but also um kind of not to sugarcoat it sometimes it's difficult you might put something out and you'd be like what what real impact is this having? Um, and you have to take a step back and be quite critical of, of the work that I'm helping them put out. And, you know, we're planning engagement events in Blackpool actually on, on the beach and we were planning it yesterday and they were coming up with all these ideas. And I was like, so what? Like, so you're gonna run that event, but what's your outcomes? What are you actually gonna achieve? Who are you gonna contact? We're not aiming at families, we're aiming at young people, which do you have a big, um, problem and a growing problem with mental health and, and loneliness so having them out and about in nature is, is really impactful so yeah it's I think it's an ongoing process and I think some events or some campaigns that you might put out aren't that impactful but there'll be good experience there's still positive things that come out of that it's not a negative experience but there'll be other things that might work much better or like you said maybe the TikTok thing will really work or maybe it won't like it's all about experimenting and I think that's what Tom and is really pushing us to do I think you said something about the great thing about experimenting is you can do it really wrong and it's fine because it's an experiment so yeah I think learning learning as you go about what is actually making a difference and what isn't and that's some, that's the reason we put this on as well to learn from each other and to pick parts from different trusts and hopefully if we do something that's really really good we'll share it with everybody um right next question does anybody have a question they'd like to say out loud and raise your hand or unmute yourself no becca Um, thank you. I realise I'm probably hijacking this because I have already asked a question, um, but it was a, a sort of follow on really from um, the question that I asked before um, about somebody, I can't remember who it was, maybe Emma said that, that you got like 50 applicants. How then did you whittle those down? What physically did you do? Um. Yes, again, it was probably an imperfect system because we're still learning, we're still trying to figure this out ourselves. So um, what we did was we, um, if there were current um, council members who wanted to stay on, they had to reapply. We had an online um, uh, form that people had to fill in. And on the online form, we asked them, um, I think we sent them a little task, which the comms team came up with, which was really good, which was to kind of write a mini blog about why they are passionate about nature. Um, and that was really interesting because they all took completely different approaches. Some sent films, some sent PowerPoints. Um, it was really creative, their different approaches, the things I'd never thought of in the application. <laughs> Applications were amazing. And then um, I actually handed them over to the, our, our head of comms, um, um, comms manager, Alan, and, and he shortlisted it. So he did a shortlist. And then there was um, another member of staff, I can't remember who it was now, who also did a shortlist. And then we brought it together, but it was, it's still an imperfect system. We're still working it out, but setting them a little task was a really useful way of bringing out their personalities and um, learning about them. Brilliant, that's helpful, thank you. Any other questions um, about logistics or something else that needs clarifying? And there's, it's not a question, but there's quite an interesting comment about visual diversity mm -hmm. that I picked up on. Uh, I don't know if Leah wants to expand on the question or to try and turn it into a question. <laughs> um, not, not.
not really a question. Uh, just yeah, just wanted to make that comment because uh, it was mentioned. Um, so at London Wildlife Trust, we've we've set up a youth forum and we're looking to progress that into um, a youth board. Um, so that's the next step. Um, but specifically in our sector, there is definitely underrepresentation in terms of vis visible. Um, minorities so um not not really wanting to use the word minority being in london um so yeah i think that is something that if people are thinking of setting up um youth boards youth councils they should definitely consider that from the start um and think about ways to remove barriers for underrepresented groups in that in being able to participate in such forums for example um some things that we're looking into is potentially paying young people for their time as well as their travel expenses, um, their refreshment costs, that, that is a way to reduce um, barriers. So initiatives like that and sort of thinking about that upfront rather than thinking about it further down the line about how to be more inclusive. So it's really just a comment rather than a question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Leah. I wonder if anyone has got any other ideas like that because we really do want to start with our um, council being diverse, but would love more ideas of exactly how to do that. It is all about getting rid of barriers, it's, but it's not easy. Because as I was saying about, you know, things like times of meetings and stuff to do with the board, it's only when you start sitting down or when you talk to people outside, you realize you've got barriers that you don't realize are barriers. And then it's, yeah, it's, it's not easy. But I think that's, to me, that's fundamental. The more you can get rid of barriers. And when you're talking about payment and, and money, yeah, you've got to realize that actually attend, getting involved in something. I, I, in the museum world, I was doing a project once for a, a volunteer organization and I, t I interviewed the volunteers and there was one lad there and he only did two days a week and he was the most valued volunteer and when I asked him why he didn't do more he said it's because his um, payments wouldn't cover more than two days of buses for him to get to the site so they just gave him the money and they suddenly had a five-day volunteer and it's little barriers like that that you can you can miss if you uh, make assumptions so I think that's that's the key. Yeah I also think um like getting out on the ground work like going out into communities because for this new youth campaigning group I've set up um I had like 68 people sign up they haven't all engaged about half the amount of them have engaged but if you look at the diversity most of them are female and Caucasian but that's because of social media algorithms who follows our social media pages who does Twitter and Facebook target when we put out sponsored ads and it, that's something that you can't, we can't really control because that's the social media platform's algorithm. So one thing is we have connections like National Citizen Service. I'm gonna go to Myersco Agricultural College as well and go and speak to them in their introduction week. Using universities introduction weeks and information, looking at charities and youth groups that already work with young people and using them as a, as a resource. Because a lot of the time, the youth groups are underfunded as well. So if, if we could, can take some people and, and really help them and give them employability skills and a community and help them learn, I think, yeah, use, use other resources as well. But I think, yeah, it's hard with COVID, but really getting, you know, on the ground, going out and speaking to people face to face and making those connections with other organizations, I think is a really good place to start. I was, just going to, I, was, I was just going to quickly say that um, I think Leah's idea about payments is really interesting when I was in a conversation with um, a friend who's a CEO of Student Union and he was saying that that's what they're starting to do as well so um, traditionally uh, a Student Union you probably have a Black History Month and traditionally it would be the BME rep on, on the, um, on the um, student council that would take on that role you know that again that's a kind of an expectation from the student union that you you have that role and therefore you have to do this piece of work and so they're going down the route of actually paying for that that student who takes on organizing that event i think that yeah maybe sort of mini scholarships to be on a board i don't know on the youth council i don't know it's an interesting idea 
Yeah, with the young trustee movement that we're heading towards, um, you're allowed to pay a young trustee. It's like legally allowed. So. Yeah, one, one thing I was just going to add as well, I don't think it's been mentioned, but I think there is a bit of a network starting to build up, isn't there, between youth groups in the wildlife trust movement, am I right in thinking? So anybody starting, you know, anybody with a, a new group starting to form, there's beginning to get a bit, of, I don't know how strong it is yet, there's beginning to get a bit of an infrastructure there where young people can talk to each other who are in similar roles, maybe Emma or Eleanor can say more about that than I know. <laughs> I was just going to type in a message that will save me. I was going to big up um, our Bright Future, um, and they've been a fantastic um, support network, but also they've got loads of really great information and resources on their website. Um, Kath and her team are brilliant. So I'm sure, again, you know, if you're know, thinking of setting up a youth council and you're needing to go somewhere, um, Kath and her team, I'm sure, will help signpost you to resources and support and ways that you can do this. Mm. I hope that's okay, Kath. I just wanted to do for some work. <laughs> I, I think I was going to make a, a sort of linked point, really. I, in, in terms of the sort of questions around diversity, I, I think that the fact that the Youth Council grew out of the My Place project definitely gave us a big sort of leg up with that. Because I think kind of almost by definition, My Place was bringing in uh, into the sort of orbit of Lancashire Wildlife Trust, people, communities, different, much greater range of backgrounds than we've traditionally had and I don't think that can be understated and I've also sort of said this before as well that it's also true of the staff because I think through the My Place project uh, a lot of the My Place officers uh, you know have come from social work backgrounds or health backgrounds or, or, or more community backgrounds rather than environmental backgrounds so I actually think there's more certainly in terms of this kind of language of you know lived experience uh, I think there's a greater diversity of people being brought in to Lancashire Wildlife Trust just as a result of my place from the staff point of view too and then the two kind of mutually reinforce each other I think if you were starting it from cold without that link to my place which obviously is the ecotherapy project funded by Albright Future I think it would have been maybe trickier but that's my perspective having not been here when it was set up. Mm -hmm. um, I'm quite aware of the time so um, shall we start to wrap up maybe if, if you can say the last top tip about what you'd say to somebody moving forward. Start with Tom. Sorry, I didn't want to go, I didn't want to go first because mine was really boring and it's probably only what you, what Steve, um, Eleanor are going to say. I think the bit that no one's mentioned is that, that I thought was really useful, which is not really about youth councils, but more around youth members on the board. Uh, is the fact that it's not like one solution. You need to work on a range of different things together because ultimately one voice, one youth voice on in any forum is, is very easy to be sort of, I don't know, is they are the only person and they kind of singled out. Whereas if you get two, that's how you get genuine change. So I really like um, the suggestion that you had, Eleanor, which is that, you know, with our, our, our um, council, with our trustees, we probably need to do three different things, which is we, probably, we need to make it much clearer that we are direct, you know, that we are accepting applications from young people. And Steve and I have had a conversation about one such individual that we might even headhunt uh, onto the board. I think the second thing is, is having young trustees and Eleanor sent the link to the young trustees movement. And then also then making sure that maybe on a rotation, we have youth council attending the board. So you kind of, you do it all. And then actually that, that, that uh, sort of massively increases your chance of success. So that's not really a CEO answer. I apologise. That's a chair answer. Sorry, Steve. That's OK, Tom. I, I was actually going to say something a bit different, really, which is that, you know, don't don't set out on this process with preconceived ideas. And just because Lancashire Wildlife Trust has done A, B and C, don't assume that's going to work for you, you know, and talk to the people, talk to the young people, because they will give you answers and solutions to some of the things you can't decide for yourself. That's that's really key. So, you know, I, it's just be flexible and be prepared to make some changes because you will undoubtedly have to do that to get there. Emma? Um, yeah, I think I probably said it several times. Um, just if you want to start one, just start one and don't worry about having all the answers and figuring it out and 
take risks and things don't always work and you learn from them and and we're still trying to figure it out I think hopefully that's come across we're still trying to figure it out so that and and we probably always will it's going to be always a need to evolve and change and yeah so just just do it and it will it will be amazing I mean, um, we need one from you as well, Eleanor. Oh, gosh. Um, I think, um, yeah, something maybe that hasn't been said, don't um, don't put yourself or the Youth Council into a box. Everybody brings something different to the table and um, you also bring something different, like Steve said, don't try and do it exactly the same way that we're doing it because you're a different trust, you have different people you have a different way of working, different trustee boards. So um, use our resources and use us, and, but also use your own kind of intuition and kind of do it, I don't know, the Surrey way or the Warwickshire way or the Avon way, like do it, do it your way. Um, and it's okay, sometimes things go wrong because life goes wrong sometimes and just have fun. That was a lot, that was a lot in one, sorry, I cheated. That's three, but have fun. <laughs> Um, yeah, so just once again, um, thank you so much, Steve and Tom. Um, I think it's really quite refreshing to have people kind of at the top come and like giving your wisdom and your knowledge and also your like, inspiration to other trustee board members and CEOs to follow in your footsteps. So thank you again, Juno. Thanks everybody for joining as well. It's been great. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining us. It's been uh, it, great. And good luck. And if anybody, get, anybody wants to get, get in started. touch, please do. Thank you very much. Yes, That's very helpful. Do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. You stop. You need to remember to stop recording now before we. <laughs>